Hey everybody, John O'Connor here again, and today we're going to be going through some viewer mail. Today's viewer mail comes from Jeremiah McQuay, the rambling man himself, who had this to say. I'd be interested to hear you talk about your single favorite game book ever. Well, what makes up my single favorite game book? Well, it would help if they had a social contract for the players to the DM. Also helps if it features a comic strip from a popular Dragon Magazine author of the 80s and 90s. Might also help if Chapter 1 focuses on role playing primarily. And it couldn't hurt if maybe they gave you some plot hooks and adventure ideas to help you run a game. So what book has all this? I'm glad you asked. It's the book of erotic fantasy. Now before you get ahead of yourself and say, well that's just like nymphology and you know it's just a trash book and you shouldn't read it. No, 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 no. Read Rule Zero. Rule Zero puts this entire book in perspective. Rule Zero says this. The DM has final say over all feats, prestige classes, and aspects of role playing included in her game. She may customize the content of Chapter 1 to suit her vision of a campaign or to her player sensibilities. So what does that mean? It means this. All ideas in the book are designed to be cherry picked for the idea for the customization of the DM. It also means that the DM is there to tell a story. And if that story makes the players feel uncomfortable, the DM shouldn't tell that story. It also tells the players, it's not your job to annoy the DM. If the DM says no, that's not allowed, it's not allowed. I think Rule Zero should be featured in a lot more role-playing books as a nice little social contract. So you don't have rules lawyers and you don't have power gamers trying to tell you, well the book says I can have this so I deserve it. No. The DM says no. It means no. And also, you know, you've got these DMs who want to do disturbing and odd storylines. If the players aren't comfortable with it, they should be able to tell their DM, well, I don't want to play this story. I don't want to talk about this subject. So Rule Zero is an amazing social contract for the GM to the player to the player to the GM. Works both ways. So, why did I pick this book? Why is it my favorite? Well, let me power through some examples. One, chapter one's completely about role playing. Now, I cut my teeth with Dungeons and Dragons. I know other systems talk about role playing, probably more extensively than this book does, but it's nice and refreshing to actually have a chapter one about role playing. On the subject of role playing, a rating table. When you talk about this element, how graphic do you want to get about it? G, where everything's just hinted at and winked about, or something a little more serious. So using this rating table and seeing where all your players are comfortable at, it's amazing. It's nice. Uh, part f point four I've got on my little notes here. Sorry, I'm reading off notes while talking to you guys. If you're world building, or if you're cultural building, there's a chart of sexual taboos. These are things that are not welcomed in the community. So if you're building a culture, here's some fine examples. Polygamy. Maybe the elves don't like it. Uh, sex outside your social caste. Now, depending on what kind of elves you play, that could be a huge is issue. Then there's universal taboos. Things that doesn't matter if you're elf or orc. Things like bestiality and necrophilia. These are things that polite society does not welcome, does not allow. So when you're world building, it's just nice to have this little list of these things are not okay. Another fun little thing they have in the book. On page 45, there's sexually transmitted diseases. And it tells you the name of the STD, how you get infected with it, uh, the, for the fortitude save you need to make, the incubation period, the damage and the effect. So it's a fun little chart if you always have the bard, barbarian, or the, the player in your campaign who's always like, well, I want to go to the brothel, I want to go to the brothel. Here's a chart to keep his ass in line. And some of the diseases are quite interesting. They take classic D&D tropes like vampirism and lycanthropy, and they also mix in some new interesting ones, like uh, burning release. So it's fun to actually, you know, hey, you want to play your character like that? There's going to be consequences. I have a chart that helps me pick these consequences. Uh, another great point of the book, 
is the species uh, conception and pregnancy table. Now I've raved about this before. It's a great table. It tells you the creature, the pregnancy chance of conception, and the gestation period. So you can cross-reference, okay, you're an elf. You want to have a son, give a legacy to the heir of a kingdom. It tells you the chance of conception and how long it's going to take before that heir is born. So, especially if you're building legacy characters, you use this chart and you determine, okay, this is the youngest or oldest this character could be if this campaign was played during this time period and we've had this much of a jump for it. Helps you build legacy characters. And of course, there's also the interspecies crossbreeding table. It's a list of about 30 different creatures and uh, will their offspring exist? Not all species can breed with all species. For example, I don't think a satar, satar and an orc can actually have a kid. It's just not going to happen. Uh, moving forward. Adventuring ideas. Now this is one of the best things in this book. These three pages give you amazing ideas. I'm going to read a couple examples for you. A polymorphed silver dragon is impregnating all the daughters of a local lord. Okay. That's actually, you know, maybe the local lord's coming to you complaining about this. Maybe the silver dragon's trying to build an army. You can play that either way. It's just a great jumping off point to build a story around. Another thing, you come into a local village and they're complaining, a band of nymphs has started seducing our young men. Some of them haven't returned yet. Well, why haven't they returned? What's going on? Are these nymphs evil or is there a bigger plot unfolding? You know, it gives you just that little bit of a jumping off point to be like, okay, this is interesting. Let's explore this. Last example, and I think it's something I, I'd actually want to build a story around. A lich has returned from a hundred year slumber to reclaim the great great granddaughter of his true love to make her his bride. Again, that one's pretty cut and dry. Uh, here's this lich been asleep for a hundred years and a village local's like, hey, we got this problem. I don't want to marry this undead creature. Help me out. So they're just interesting jumping off points that this book offers. I think it's really cool. I think it's interesting. And again, it's something you can just cherry pick. Here's the basis of an idea. Now let's build a campaign around it. Uh, something else I think the book does really well is the fact that it actually has an index. Um, I'm kind of disappointed in later books in the D&D line. They didn't have an index. And a lot of third-party material didn't have an index. It was, oh, you didn't read the book from beginning to end? Well, that's on you. Instead of, okay, go to the index, look up a keyword, here's all the places it's mentioned, then you can go back, read up on the particular thing you want to know about, and then be done with it. And the last thing that I really think takes this book to the next level, what's new with Phil and Dixie Comic? Uh, Phil and Dixie Comics were a popular insert of Dragon Magazine in the 80s and 90s, and then they had a... I'm not going to say short-lived, but it, it's over now. Uh, revisitation, or revival, brought to life again uh, from 2007 to 2010. Uh, they're not making any new comics anymore. But it's interesting that something that was actually featured in Dragon Magazine is featured in this book. A lot of third-party publishers can't say that. So it got the attention of somebody. And uh, that's the reasons why this is my favorite book. Everything in it, in it is meant to be cherry-picked. You take the aspects you like, you take the ideas you like, and you leave everything else behind. Plus it gives you a great idea of a social contract between you and your players. So, Jeremiah, I hope that answers your question. And as always, if you're enjoying what I'm doing, and you're liking the videos, please like, share, and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching, guys. Hey there, everybody. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I just wanted to do the small aside to talk about the pre- and post-production of today's video. Uh, we actually had a decent rainstorm today, and it stirred up a lot of dust in the house and outside on the property, and so it really messed with my nose. So I had to 
start over, redo it a couple times. So when I actually got the take that I was going to keep, my voice was a little messed up, and through the entire thing, my nose was just driving me crazy. Uh, so I apologize if my voice sounds a little off today. Also, the background noise. I'm recording in a room that doesn't have an air conditioner on and doesn't have a ceiling fan going, but yet I'm still getting a lot of background noise and I'm trying to figure out what that's about. Also, twice in the video, it sounded like I was thumping against the table or thumping on the computer. Uh, my hands and feet weren't touching anything, so I don't know what produced that sound twice in the video. But uh, I hope you'll work with me and get through this. Uh, I hope it's not taking away from the content I'm presenting. And as always, guys, thank you so much for watching. Uh, I'll see you again real soon.